What's going on, y'all? Today's guests are Connie Quintanilla and Gabriela Fernandez of the beautiful, historic Olympia Theater in Miami, Florida. Connie is the production coordinator for the Olympia Theater, and she also has her own company, Fans on Cube, where she trains and develops casted audiences and seat fillers. And then Gabby is the Director of Theater Operations at Olympia Theater, and she also has her own company, uh, the Front Yard Theater Collective. So today we're gonna talk about how to run a venue, how COVID-19 has affected their venue and just show business in general, uh, having a side hustle and a little bit about their companies, creative ways to put on theater shows, what are cast audiences and seat fillers, uh, potential other opportunities out there for people that want to have a career and a job in the entertainment industry, right? And before we get to the conversation with Connie and Gabby, please make sure to subscribe down below. Uh, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment with any questions you have. We'd love to engage with you guys, answer any questions, and uh, build a community right here around, around learning about the music business. I hope you enjoy this conversation with the amazing Connie Quintanilla and Gabriela Fernandez. <laughs> Live the life you love. So I guess uh, to get started, tell me about your time at the Olympia Theater. So you both work at the Olympia Theater. Um, what's your current role there? And um, yeah, what's your current role? And we'll start with Connie, just so everyone knows the difference of uh, each of your voices. Yeah, even though we sound like I'm over the phone all the time, but <laughs> yeah. So my name is Connie. I am the production manager at the Olympia Theater at the historic Olympia Theater mm -hmm. in Miami, um, Florida. Um, basically, I do a little bit of everything. We, we do a lot of front of house management. We, we start off with the booking of the talent, you know, providing production, getting all, you know, every department together to make sure that the show runs smoothly. Um, and then we switch gears once show day is happening. We deal with a lot of front of house, uh, front of house logistics and um, talent logistics as, uh, you know, just to make sure that everything is running smoothly. Gabby? Um, well, we, yeah, I do a lot of the same things that Connie does. We work very tightly as a team. Um, I mostly deal with a lot of the back end stuff. Um, I deal with a lot of paperwork for the pre production and a lot of the post production stuff. So when it comes to negotiations and settlements and kind of that side of thing, that's more where I come in. Awesome, cool. So pretty much most, most of the areas of the theater and running a venue, which is cool. Uh, so in the entire live entertainment industry, not just music, the live entertainment industry has been completely dismantled and is mostly shut down. There's not a lot of live events happening right now. How has COVID-19 affected you guys and the Olympia Theater? Um, I mean, I think it's affected us pretty much the same as any other venue. We've been closed since mid-March. We actually had to cancel the Miami Film Festival halfway through. Um, and we haven't produced any shows or anything from the theater since then. So it's been very, very tough. And, you know, a lot of people have depended on working with us, um, hasn't been able to work since March. Like all of our usher staff, all of our bartenders, our cleaning crews, like all our, our stage crew, like all these people that rely on a gig economy has not had any economy. So it's, it's been pretty bad, man. Yeah, super tough. My, my, my next, like, so I was on parental leave right before um, like this all started. And my first show back from parental leave was supposed to be with you guys. Um, I think it was Greg Reporter or whatever uh, what it was. And yeah, that was supposed to be my first show back. So I, I actually been like in quarantine for maybe a month longer than, than everyone else. And man, I'm definitely have felt stir crazy. And it's crazy to see how this is affecting our industry. Yeah, we yeah. live in a very high pace. Uh, we work in a very high pace industry. So constantly on the work, constantly doing more than your typical 40 hours a week. So mm -hmm. for it to just abruptly end and then us try to figure ourselves out, it's been quite a challenge, quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's hard for us that we're always on the move to kind of have this downtime um, because we're not used to it. We're just used to go, go, go. So as for me personally, I've been doing improvement, decorating, uh, uh, cooking, becoming this uh, domestic 
uh, mother that I am. So it, it kind of, you know, at the same time, it kind of has an advantage as well because you're doing a lot of the things you never had time to do. Mm-hmm. Now you're getting it done and spending that quality time at home. Yeah, right. Because so this whole COVID thing, like the, most of the conversation, like when you watch the news and read things online, it's so like dark and doom and gloom all the time. Um, what are things, some of the positives that you hope that come out of it and that you hope to continue carry to carry on with you um, going back into our busy lifestyles whenever that happens? Man, that's such a good question. I feel like I've acquired a lot of negative habits during the quarantine <laughs> that I hope to get rid of once we find our new normal. The quarantine um, 15. <laughs> the quarantine 15 is a fact. It, it might be more than 15. Look, at this point, might, 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 have... be, might be 30. <laughs> I'm, I'm on on 20. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did, I do, in a positive note, I think the whole going virtual thing that the world is experiencing right now to me has been something very fascinating to watch. Um, And I've kind of seen how that transition to virtual has been a make it or break it for a lot of different types of theater groups and music groups and performers. And it's posed a new challenge creatively. You know, How how do you engage your audiences? How do you stay relevant? How do you stay current without relying on just Zoom videos all the time? Right. So for me, that's been one of my challenges is to learn more about video editing and video content and social media. So it's been interesting and fun for me. For me, positive on this, um, personally, is been giving me chance to structure myself, my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've learned patience, a lot of it, especially having a toddler at home. Um, <laughs> In work, in, in, in the work life, I feel like I've challenged myself to also explore new, new, new normal, you know, mm-hmm. what's going to be the next thing for production, what's going to be um, the safety protocols, what it, like, you know, it, it got me reading a lot and researching a lot. Like, I feel like everything that's been coming about, like, I've, I've been curious and I look into it and research and, um, and also kind of be having to reinvent the wheel in a sense, because I deal with a lot of audience. So now it's like, okay, how do we, we get this back? How do we do this in the new normal? Like, how can we feel safe, you know, you know, still provide some type of entertainment, but at the same time, keep that in mind of safety is our number one issue. So it's been, it's been a learning curve all the way through. Like it's been a a kind of having to go back into the books and and do your research and, and plan ahead. So in that sense, it has given me that. Yeah, kind of get the, the time for the things we never had time for right now, right? Yeah. Which is some good, good coming out of that for sure. Tell me about your journeys, like leading up to like before getting to the Olympic Theater, like maybe from school to like where you guys worked or interned before getting to the theater and was entertainment something you always wanted to get into? Oh, I was me and went to school here in Miami, went to college in Miami, did a couple of um, internship in Atlanta. And then I felt like Miami wasn't cutting it for me in the production side. It's, you know, a hard, it's a very limited, at that time, uh, we're, calling, we're talking about the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. It was a very limited um, opportunity to get into production here as it was still not as, as fast paced as it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided to pack up my bags and go to LA. <laughs> so what it was supposed to be a six months uh thing uh it became 12 years wow. <laughs> um but i felt like i was born and raised here but i grew up in la because i was 24 when i um, when i came back here at 35 36 so um what i did in la when i first got there my whole thing was i need to get into production even though i went to school for mass communication and pr i fell in love with of behind the scenes like I wanted to create I wanted to produce uh, so I started off uh, with seat fillers I, I was a seat filler in Miami a couple of shows that they had here and I kind of hustled my way to getting to know crew, and I sweet talked the crew to get me to the to the who the boss was in charge and one of the reasons why I, I went to LA was because they were based out of LA mm-hmm. so when I finally made my connection I you know it was just God sent like I went ahead and, and connected through that person, that company. Uh, she was a, a stage manager in the DGA in the in the union, so she had a lot of gigs. And yeah, 
first gig foot in LA was the ESPYs in 2006 in Hollywood. Oh, nice. And SBs. it was, it was, it was life changing to me. I couldn't believe that I was finally there. Um, and then from there, it was just, you know, the hustle, the networking. Um, and then before, you know, it, I was, there was doors being, you know, I was knocking on doors, doors were being open. Uh, I did a little bit of everything from production, five awards production. I did a film festivals out there as well. Um, I did a couple of PA jobs on other short films and documentaries as well. And that got me through a lot of the years in LA, just, you know, breaking down doors and, and getting through it and getting and, and getting the experience that I was able to bring back to Miami. Um, and I was able to establish my own production company here where I provide a uh, casted audience and seat fillers now for uh, a big Spanish network. And, um, and that's what I do. I, I, besides I do what I do in Olympia is my full time, but on the side I gig out and I am able to, uh, provide casted audience, um, uh, marketing, uh, in, uh, events as well as um, red carpets and a couple of a little bit of everything under my own production company. But right now, the one that is really taking the lead on this is our, it's my website called Fans on Cue. We provide sea fillers, casted audience, uh, fan pit audience to live award shows. So it's been cool. It's been a cool ride. It's, you got to love it. You have to love yeah. production to be able to be successful at it. That's awesome. What is a, I've never heard anybody talk about this on the podcast before. What's a seat filler and cassette audience? What is that? Um, so they basically are like what extras are to movies. They're yeah. like the extras on live award shows. So a lot of uh, live award shows that you see on TV, like the Oscars, the Golden Globes, BET Awards, MTV Awards, mm. um, they require the, the producers and executive producers of the shows would like to always see a full house. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially these camera seats uh, that usually talents don't stay sitting for a long time. They usually are backstage or being perform or doing performance on stage. So they want they don't want to see empty seats. Right. So that's when these casted seat fillers or casted audience come into play, and we place them during commercial breaks. So it's like a little bit of a, a Hollywood secret. Not everybody knows about it, <laughs> but it is a thing. Um, mm -hmm. People do make a living out of this. <laughs> um, so, so depending on the show, depending on what the producers want to see on a live screen uh, is where I come in and I cast these um, audience, depending on the demo, the targeted demo that the producers want. So um, a lot of people, you see fan pits on stage. Those are casted audience and seat fillers. Uh, a lot of majority of the people you see sitting in these camera seats, especially at these very high end award shows, 50% are seat fillers. Huh, um, and then so on and so on and also casted audience are used also to keep the energy alive so like on the on the red carpet bleachers those are casted audience anywhere that they need energy and 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 in good fun on camera those are basically casted audience that's awesome um i was almost a seat filler once for uh, a wrestling event in miami <laughs> but uh uh, had, had to be yeah. <laughs> had to be at home for the baby <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was coming any day. but um <laughs> And so it's basically like, that's just something that probably someone can only really get into in a city that has a lot of those like live televised events. So cities like Miami, New York, LA, maybe Vegas. Atlanta, Nash Vegas, Nashville. Yeah, yeah interesting. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Well, that's 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 in the in the in the before times because now it doesn't even matter if you're in a big city with a lot of events because everything's changing to virtual. So yeah. now you have to find a new a new way to do virtual. And it's happening. Virtual. And it's happening. Virtual audiences. Yes. <laughs> yes. Virtual, virtual audiences. Yes. It's about to happen. So yeah, that's uh, that's all of what I was saying before. It's researching and seeing how you still could be able to bring that to the table, um, not physically, but now we have to go into this virtual cyberspace world of like everything is going to be now Zoom or Google Hangout mm -hmm. or Microsoft Team or, or et cetera, et cetera. I was always wondering. I'll cast you on the next one. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. I mean, I always wondered if that would be a thing one day, right? Because like, it's no secret. I'm a big wrestling fan. And like, I was, and they're still like going on with their live events, just with no audience. And I always like wondered what an event would be like with just a bunch of screens around the, the stage uh, with people on Zoom or something. <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. Have you seen any of the European soccer matches lately? The German soccer matches, yeah, where they have like the, the audience playing over the PA. Is that what you're talking about? 
yeah, exactly. You have the entire empty stadium and just the sound of the audience over the PA. It's so wow. weird. I, I can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't. It doesn't feel natural. It's just like watching a, a practice. That's like what. But it, it feels like a practice. Yeah. Yeah, but like a practice where people are actually trying to win, which I guess I don't know. I have to like always try to win in practice, but <laughs> side yeah. changing. <laughs> I, I wonder. Um, yes, I attended. I wonder how how the players feel like giving your all. Like as a performer, I'm like shit. How do you give your all? And there's no nobody there to clap at you or even yell at you or curse at you or whatever. It's gotta be. It's gotta be weird. Yeah. It's gonna be so weird. I can't even imagine. Like imagine you being a theater person, like doing a play uh for no audience or an audience that's watching at home i mean i'll tell you one thing i would rather have a small audience than a virtual audience because (laughs) it's been so weird we've been me and my theater group we've been performing virtually um Hmm. so a lot of these improv groups what they do is they perform on zoom and what Hmm. we did is we did um like a saturday night live sketch comedy type of show but with no budget Mm-hmm. And since we're all quarantined, everybody would film their own stuff at home, and then I would get all the footage and edit it and, and put it all together. So it's really exciting, and then you put it out on Facebook Live, but then you're sitting in your living room, <laughs> and people are chatting and stuff, and then it, and then it ends, and then you're home. So right. it's like very bittersweet. So we're like a good friend of mine uh, that's been on the podcast a few times. He's like one of my mentors. He always says that I should be doing more like Instagram lives and Facebook lives because of like my podcast and like speaking to like people on zoom and speaking to a classroom, no problem. But like doing Instagram live or Facebook live, I'm like, I get so in my head about that. Like I have, it sounds so scary to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I well, mean, yeah, I- because go ahead, go ahead, go funny. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Gabby. Cause the thing is, when you're when you're doing your class whoever saw that class in person that's who saw that class you know what i mean if you weren't there you didn't see whatever happened right um the same thing with the podcast you get to edit your podcast and you get to take out whatever you feel like like you didn't sound so great or whatever Mm -hmm. but when it comes to being live on stage or on instagram or on facebook what you say is going to live there for a while Mm -hmm. if not forever right so like i could understand being self-conscious about you know, what if I say something and it gets taken out of context? Or what if I appear to be foolish? Or what if I look stupid and then it lives there forever and anybody right. can see it? Right. And, and the thing too is that I get in my head about is it's not even so much the like the musicians or like people are studying about the music business, like watching. It's like when I see my friends' names pop up or my family members pop up, I'm like, oh, great. Like now my friends are <laughs> watching me and they're going to be judging me and sending me <laughs> stupid text messages. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens, man. That's yeah. exactly what happens because it's happened to me throughout the, doing this internet shows. It's like I got two of my aunties were watching and they just started having a conversation amongst themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and the conversation was about me, but like, you know, it's, it's like a humble brag, but oh, isn't she cute? Isn't she great? She's so talented. Oh, Gabby, we love you. And this, this, this is my actual official theater group page. Mm-hmm. You know? So I'm like, you guys, don't put me on the spot like this. Like, <laughs> say nice things about the group. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, go, going back to your, your story leading up to the Lincoln Now you have better connection. Um, we kind of like lost you when you were talking about making, I think it was connections with like uh, theater directors. Yes. Um, there's a blind spot of signal leaving my house. So that's where it was. Um, well, yeah. So when, when I, when I moved here, I started to try to pursue more of the behind the scenes work. Mm-hmm. So I started to make a lot of connections with theater directors. Um, and I started working as um, stage manager and assistant director. I worked in lights. I worked in sound. I mean, basically, you could put me anywhere in a theater and I'll kind of figure my way out. Mm-hmm. Um, well, now I don't know because now everything's digital. This is back <laughs> where you had actual buttons and knobs on the mixers <laughs> and the machine. Uh, but then through that work, I was able to, to gain a lot of experience and bring that to my theater group, from your Theater Collective, shameless plug, and mm-hmm. uh, produce shows with them. And through producing shows with my theater group, I started collaborating with the Olympia Theater in a couple of projects that I did. So my boss at the Olympia saw me running my show and um, he really liked the work that I was doing and he loved collaborating with me. So after the second project together, 
he offered me a full-time position at the Olympia. Awesome. Tell me more about yeah. your, your theater company. Uh, my theater oh, company so no, is The non-shameless plug. <laughs> the non-shameless plug, exactly. Thank <laughs> you for taking away the shame. It's called, it's called Front Yard Theater Collective. And the reason why it's called Front Yard Theater is because we also do landscaping. No, I'm kidding. Ah. Uh, she got me there too i was like wait what <laughs> yeah i don't know about this <laughs> well <laughs> i'm very passionate about trees um so it's called front yard theater because we started in my friend's front yard and slowly but surely now we have become one of south florida's um improv and sketch comedy names here um and now we are the resident company of the Olympia Theater. Nice. So, and I always like to point out that we were the resident company of the Olympia Theater before they hired me. And it's because <laughs> of the fact that they, that they love from their theater, that's why they hired me. It's that's not awesome. the other way around. <laughs> um, and yeah, we mostly do sketch comedy and, and improv. And we've done a couple of one act plays here and there. And we are the proud inventors of bicycle theater. Bicycle theater. Yes. Tell me more. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, Chris. Uh, speaking of, uh, of what Kai said that you really have to love production, <laughs> this, is, this is a project that you really have to love to be able to do. So the idea was, um, what if we did a play where the audience was riding a bicycle and every stop of the bike ride was a different scene of the mm, play? That sounds cool. So it was very, very cool. So we did it twice. The first time we did Alice in Wynwood Land. So we had five stops in all over Wynwood. And in each stop was like one of the emblematic Alice moments. So we had, um, well, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was the Wynwood Cigar Factory. That's where the Mad Hatter scene took place. But we, everything, everything was adapted to Miami. Mm -hmm. So the Mad Hatter was actually an ultra party. And instead of drinking tea, they were drinking Molly. Ecstasy. Ecstasy. Sorry. Ecstasy. <laughs> Ecstasy. I know. My husband was a Mad Hatter, so he's like, uh-uh, ecstasy. <laughs> uh, Margaret Pace Park, we did the um, Tweedle Dee and Tweedle Dumb, but they were muralists. The Caterpillar was a thrift shop owner. You know, very manly, very hipster. That was the huge success. Um, and then the second time we did it, we did a play called History on Wheels. Same concept as the previous bike ride, but this time we actually got permits and we actually got funding for it. That's cool. Because the first, yeah, the first time we gorilla the crap out of it. Um, so this time we learned, since this is a production podcast, this time we learned that we needed to have two sound systems instead of just one <laughs> that would follow around. We had two sound systems that would leapfrog to every mm -hmm. other stop ahead of us um, to set up the microphones and everything. Um, we had a police escort for the bicycles. We had some street closures. Um, and we had to have uh, contracts with the venues and the spots in writing. Um, we applied for a couple of grants and we got them. And that's actually how we started working with the Olympia because the Olympia became our headquarters. Uh, and their dressing rooms became our headquarters. That's, that's such a cool concept. I love that. And the whole like leapfrogging thing reminds me of like when big like stadium tours tour. Um, basically, I mean, of course, you guys are doing it all in the same day, but um, they'll like leapfrog each other. So they'll have like a, you know a, a production and a B production, and like one will be in Miami, the other will be in Atlanta, and then like they leapfrog each other. So they're not the same production crews working those ungodly hours setting mm -hmm. up <laughs> a stadium show. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a cool concept. So going into some like lessons about running a venue. Based on like your experience and dealing like with, with COVID now, um, if you were to give some advice to someone that's in college right now, uh, taking some classes, they have the flexibility of taking some um, electives as well that are outside of their programs, which classes do you feel would really help prepare someone um, for working at a venue? Study um. law. <laughs> 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 psychology i'm just kidding <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um um i'm gonna tell you when i went to college i was studying mass communication it it was not until like i think my second or third year in college i definitely found my way like i started i don't know why i started with criminal justice then i took psychology mm -hmm. and then i said okay at this i want production because that's what i did in high school. I did a lot of TV production and radio production out there. Um, 
I feel like I feel like you need to definitely take diversity, diversity mm -hmm. uh, classes, uh, learn learn your 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 audience, learn your culture, learn uh, society. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, I took mass communication, introduction to mass communication, a little bit of journalists. Um, right now, programs are a little bit more extend and more available than it was mm -hmm. before. Um, so I don't know what the curriculums are for now for people getting in production, but I feel that what helped me get through was also to understand because I don't feel production is in textbooks. Right. I think production is a hands-on experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, yes, yes. So I feel that once you start getting the textbook out of the way your best thing that's going to help you is internships mm -hmm. get out there network get out there volunteer uh, get your hands dirty get you know get get do as much as involvement you can even if it starts at the bottom you eventually work yourself up so for the more you're exposed to the industry at hands and mm -hmm. and and physically the more you're going to get to know if this is actually something you want to do mm -hmm because you won't find it in a textbook. That's yeah. my advice. So good, yeah. Yeah, yeah you have anything to add? Yes, I think that a, a, a very important part of especially the show business industry in general, whether it be music or, or performance or movies or whatever, is to be able to relate either behind the scenes or in front of the scenes. So definitely if you're taking a production, if you're studying production of any kind and you get some free time, I would say take an improv class Mm -hmm. And it's not just because I'm an improv geek and an improv advocate, but improv can translate to so many other parts of your life. Um, and it, it, it helps your communication skills. It, it helps you listening. It helps you working under pressure, which is all things that will happen while you work in production. And also when you take even the smallest acting class or anything, just even if it's just one semester, just one small class of workshop, it finds it, it, it gives you the tool to relate to the person you're talking to at work. Mm -hmm. So if you're a PA and you need to talk to talent, or if you're a director or a stage manager and you need to give a direction, you will have the, the language, the tools, and the empathy to be able to communicate exactly what you want. Because if you're going to tell somebody you need to find your light, you need to know how to find your light on a stage. So it, uh, it always helps. Yeah, it always has to do both sides. That's just great advice for, for, for both of those, right? I always say when, when Ollie, my, my baby boy, is ready to figure out what he wants to do for a living, like I'm going to encourage him to, to intern as much as possible and just work as many events as possible. Um, because that's like what it's about, like working as many events as you can. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kevin Lyman, who started Warp Tour, but he kind of started that same way. He was a, a college student that worked a, a, an event every weekend, and eventually that led to him working... 250 events a year and then all of a sudden being the guy that started web tour um so it's such good advice uh both those, yeah. both those two. and you know what to add to to, to the, the this particular industry that we're in especially the music industry it's 80 percent is who you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. or maybe even more you know and then maybe 10 percent is your knowledge and then the other 10 percent is luck you know yeah, yeah. so yeah. The, the more that you put yourself out there and the more people you talk to the better yep. mm -hmm. how do you what advice would you give on so building relationships right that's such an important piece um like how do you build good relationships that are authentic um and how do you know when someone is um kind of more in it for, for of the game of building relationships than actually like building authentic relationships connie you start with this one <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's an interesting question, Chris. <laughs> um, I want to say experience how many years you're in. Like, I'm going to give you an example. Mm -hmm. I, my first year in, in LA, I was as gullible as you can be. <laughs> I, saw, I thought that everything that shined was gold until mm -hmm. I experienced firsthand what a con artist is, what a uh, fake in the mm -hmm. industry is. Mm -hmm. And once you experience that, once you experience your yeah, first burn, um, you start waking up to a lot of things. You, you pick up that sixth sense of like, go with that gut feeling. I feel like that gut feeling is your, your, your guardian angel or like your intuition telling you, hey, stop your research, mm -hmm. scope the, the, the whole entire scenery, the whole entire thing, the person, 
And if it smells like crap and it looks like <laughs> crap, guess what? It is crap. No, 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 nothing more than that. So I feel like experience will, will let you read into people, into the, 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 the production, into the, the whole, whole entire hope of every, everything else. You have to go with that gut feeling. I, I feel that. And, and, um, you won't be able to do that. And unfortunately, you know, I, I had to experience so I could believe that. Like you have to get dirty. You have to fall a few times so mm -hmm. it could kind of get it embedded in your head. Like, hey, do your research. Hey, look at things from another perspective. Like do the, stop, you know, and question. Never be afraid to question anything. You have to question it. You have to make sure that what you want to hear is facts and you feel comfortable on how to pursue the next step. That's such a good point, dude, because a lot of people, when they're scamming you, the minute you start asking a lot of questions, they'll act annoyed or mm -hmm. they'll say like, ah, you're so intense. Mm -hmm. I, what do you want to know? And it's like, no. Uh, one thing I learned from Connie actually was when you're a legit person working in production, you over communicate, you answer every question. You question everything. So we you know if you want to learn like, okay, how am I get, getting scammed? If the person is iffy about their answers, they're getting scammed. That's good to but, also, but also at the same time, you kind of have to get burned. It's, it's, it's kind of like hazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to work in this industry, you're going to get burned. Yeah. There's no way around it. In fact, try to get burned earlier on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my whole entire 24 year of when I turned 24 it was a year of like scam burn what the hell like FML like it was constantly happening but as I always say you fall down seven you get up eight so to me it's 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 that's how you're gonna learn that's how you're gonna mm -hmm. learn like you tell your kids like don't do that don't do that oh they did it they fell look what happens you mm -hmm. learn now mm -hmm. So I, that's, that's how it is in our field, in our industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And get so, everything in writing, bro. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In writing, document everything. Black and white, black and white. Yes. That's something very important, especially those starting off. You want to get everything in writing. So it reminds me of my, my favorite Rocky quote in our industry. <laughs> Such a good example. So it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how often you can get hit and keep moving forward. <laughs> yes. yes. Yep. 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 And that's exactly. good. That's really good. Exactly. What What are all the different roles uh, and departments at a theater like yours, and what are maybe some of the best opportunities for someone to like start their career and get started in a, a venue like that? I think the Olympia Theater is a little bit different than other places. I feel because we are in a way a smaller team. Um, the fact that it's a historic theater and that it, it's got a, like a complicated history to it. Mm -hmm. But like in regular venues, I think there's a lot of volunteer programs, especially for uh, volunteer ushers and stuff like that. So that's a good way to start if you kind of are lost and just want to take a little peek into the, the world of that. Um, but a lot of times in order to work in a theater, it might be easier to reach to a determined uh, production company. Mm -hmm. and maybe go for the, the PA positions with a production company directly who will then in turn rent the venue. Mm -hmm. And then you can start building a relationship with that venue. Because most yeah. of the times, not many venues do their own programming. Mm -hmm. So a lot of venues have a very small skeleton crew. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly. do you think, Bonnie? Yeah, no, 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 I agree. Depending on the venue and the in the type of venue it is, um, depend. Like for example, different venues have programs that they go after in colleges for interns for either mm -hmm. marketing, sales. Um, they have internships, especially a lot in, in in events and sales and marketing. That's where mostly the internships come in. Mm -hmm. um, us in the in the in the Olympia Theater, as Gabby mentioned, we're a smaller venue. Are you know not many not many departments. I think we we do a little bit of every department. Uh, but if that's an opportunity, as, as mentioned before, an internship, you may want to look into if that program is provided in that venue. And it all depends on what you want to get into. Like, there's so many departments in a venue to make up, to put a show together. You have a box office, which is ticketing. You have uh, your stage crew, which is part, depending on the venue, it's partly a union crew 
or a house crew. So you would have to investigate that. Um, there is the front of house staff, which is ushering, security, uh, ticket takers. Then you have your food and beverage department as well. Like you have the bartending, the catering, um, the food. Which could be session. its own beast in itself. Yeah, exactly. So depending on what the person wants to get her or him into, uh, it, you just got to look for, for that program. And if that program is offered in that, in that, uh, in that venue, but as I said, every, every, every venue is different. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you have to know what you want to get into. Like, is it events, yeah. is it marketing, is it sales, yeah. is it front of house, is it box office ticketing, like how to see seating maps and getting the, the logistics yeah. on that. Is it actual labor crew, like the tech crew, is it technical stuff that you want to get into and so on and so on. You mentioned also working with different like production companies uh, as a, I guess as someone that like mentors venues also, I'm a big advocate for like independent venues, not necessarily like, of course, Live Nation or AG owned venues and major like promoter owned venues probably won't do this, but for an independent venue, um, I'm a big advocate of working with outside production companies and, out, um, and outside promoters because one, it reduces the venue's risk on, on doing shows. And then the other pro is um, you, you do more shows by being open and having other people come in and bring shows in. What are some of the pros and cons of working with partners and what makes a good partnership? Um, I think some of the, some of the pros of working with big partners is the expense um, mm -hmm. that you get to split the expense. The con is that you, that you um, split the profit as well, obviously. Right. Uh, but like what you just said, it's a, it's a less of a risk for a, a smaller venue or an independent venue in case there is a loss, you share that loss. Um, and in my experience, a big con of working with that type of partnerships is that you do lose a lot of control over your terms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, you kind of are relying on, because typically when you run the venue, your partner is the liaison with the talent. Mm -hmm. So you lose a lot of the final saying negotiations, you know, you have to make a lot of concessions with your merchandise commissions and your ticketing fees and all that stuff, which ultimately makes us less money. Mm -hmm. Working with these different promoters and, um, and artists, like not, not every show is, is easy. You know, not always have an easy tour manager or production manager that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone um, on dealing with difficult people? Because I'm, I feel like there's a lot of that still in our industry, especially don't want to, I guess like I don't know, shame the older generation. Name but, some name. I don't, I don't, I don't want to shame the older generation, but it tends, tends to be like the ones from like the seventies and eighties that yes. um, have have sometimes difficult personalities. And and there's the millennials also that are are challenging to work with. Uh, so I guess that does hit everyone. So I'm not I'm not generalizing. But um, what advice would you give dealing with with difficult people? Listen, I feel like. I, I, the Connie's already, Connie's already, uh, her, her jaw already got tight and her eyebrow has left the building. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll, I'll put in my, I'll input something. I think you have to listen. You have to listen. You have to pay attention. You, you know, I feel like, like a lot of people don't listen and they just go and, and try to please the talent a hundred percent without consulting, let's say your co-pro, like, you know, who the venue is, you know, getting to know the venue staff, like the venue staff are the people that are going to help you look good. Right. So, you know, these pre-production talks and, and calls and, and now it's really important. So you get to know who you're working with offhand. So when a show day comes, we're all on the same page. And as Gabby says, I'm an over communicator. It might sound redundant to you because you've been on tour with the talent for so many weeks, but it's, it is new to us as the, as the venue and as the first city that they're coming to, a new city that they're coming to. So yes, take your time to know each venue. I know it's time consuming. I know it's stressful already because you're on the road, but these are the people that are going to make that city look good for the talent. And not only that, it's going to make your job a little easier once you get to know the venue staff and their venue protocol. And everything is open for negotiation as, makes, as long as it makes sense. Get what I'm saying? So you can be promising the talent X, Y, and Z 
without consulting that venue if that X, Y, and C is approved or it is even possible to have, you know? So listening, communicating, making sure everybody's on the same page prior to show day. So in show day, we have room to put out any fires mm -hmm. that we didn't discuss. So it leaves room to everything to go smooth. But if there are fires to put out, we're equipped to that because we crossed our T's and dotted our I's prior to that. So, um, so at the end of the day, it's listening, communicating, and, and, and just, you know, working as a team, team, you know, what is it? I was just going to mention that te teamwork is a dream work because yeah. a good way to prevent drama is to build a solid team on your side. So for example, Connie and I, not only are we a good team, but we're, we're, we're friends outside of the, of work, but we have the, the, the good cop, bad cop thing going on. You know what I mean? So when Connie is, is Mrs. No, I'll be Mrs. <laughs> yes, or vice versa. Like it, it, it's funny because for example, for, um, I'm not going to name any names, but for, <laughs> uh, for, for, let's say some drag queen shows, right? I know that Connie is most, she's a fan of drag queen shows in general. So she knows who's who. So, so she'll be Miss Yes for that yeah. show. And I'll be the bummer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then when it comes to the nerdy shows, um, and this one I'll name because last podcast on the left is amazing um but when it came to that show that i was fangirling i was the yes we can we got to and Connie was a well hold on a second wait no. a minute so it's always nice to have like a, a team to fall back on or like our our stage crew um our tech director wayne uh you know when Connie and i are going nuts i'll be like yo wayne can you tell these people that they can't be doing this because you've been working with them all day and then he'll go to them and he'll be like look gabby and Connie, they're bitches <laughs> yes. you can't do this man because then they're gonna nag at me you know so you kind of manipulate your way through difficult people <laughs> yeah it's just working as a team it's getting to as i said it's team effort like it, it makes it it's solid trade secrets yeah <laughs> it's a it's a, team, it's a team effort and, and sometimes we're not saying no because we just want to say no it's because logistically it's not happening or logistically we weren't prepared enough to make this happen in within two hours. Like for example, when people decide to do meet and greets at the last minute mm -hmm. and yet they're started late, yet they're, they're, they're complaining about we're already over budget, but yet you want to do a, 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 a meet and, a meet and yeah. greet. That's or even take. worse, we already let half of our staff go home. Exactly. So it's up to the promoter <laughs> who's with the talent to communicate, listen, this is our concern. This is what cannot be done. And, and because of this and this, so, getting on the same page and being like look if it's a perfect world absolutely we would love to have it well you know but realistically speaking we let go of our staff and we can't we don't have sec enough security to you know it's just everything has to be planned out and it takes a team it takes a village to make a successful show happen um for for everybody including the talent absolutely yeah so the secret is find out who at the venue is the bigger fan and then just go to them <laughs> first first yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah no absolutely i mean i feel like um i don't think i have not been like i mean i got introduced a lot this year uh, no last year uh with podcasts i didn't know what podcast was and to mm -hmm. me like i just saw that gabby was geeking out about it i was like okay let me see what it is <laughs> still not 100 percent, but it's something that is like i get it i i understand it and it's cool it's amazing mm -hmm. it's cool it's i mean you know, I'm old school. I love radio, but but this is the new radio, I guess. It's a new radio. Yeah. yeah. That, that and Spotify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or Pandora. Exactly. Or Pandora. I still or Pandora. Or Pandora. <laughs> <laughs> what, what or is you something... my husband, YouTube. YouTube. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> what is something you wish promoters knew and were mindful of when working with a venue? We can't read your mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can't read your mind. We're not psychic. We're not, you know. Or like, or tell me, tell me how to communicate with you. Because a lot of times promoters will get, oh, I, I don't have time to read emails. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, yes, you, yes. Then let me know and I will call you every two days. I don't mind. <laughs> like, yes. what works best for you? Text? You want text messages? I got to. I'll text you. You know, like, uh, a pigeon? 
I'll, I'll get a messenger pigeon. <laughs> Neon smoke, sign? Smoke well, well, yeah. <laughs> like, like, for example, Chris, you know, example, you know my, you've seen my emails when we do mm -hmm. production schedule, how I bullet point highlight, God, I almost put a neon sign on there if I could. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, you are one of the few that actually reads and like replies back of just at least acknowledging that you somewhat read this email, you somewhat, you know, what's happening, where to park, especially when you're approaching the venue. I was just so, gonna say, where to park? Yeah. Never <laughs> ask the venue where to park because they probably sent you those instructions already. Like we know, we this is not our first rodeo. Like, and it's we, a copy and paste. Yeah, so it's like, you know that the very basic information is on those emails, especially if it says, please read and uh, open attachment, you know, we give you parking passes. I mean, at least speaking on behalf of the Olympia Theater, we, we go ahead of ourselves and be like, okay, here's a map with nice little arrows because <laughs> Gabby loves to do those or stars. <laughs> and then me with my bullet points highlighted, bolded, it's like how much more information you can. So when you approach the venue and you're calling us off the hook, because we, the venue, we're not just sitting around waiting for you guys to approach. We are already on like food and beverage, getting set up, making sure that everything, right, exactly. you know, putting out our own fire. So when you call us in distress mode, talking about, we don't know where to park the tour bus. <laughs> it's like, really dude, like two days ago. That's your one job? That's <laughs> No, and the thing is, as a, as a tour manager, as a promoter, sometimes you can get very caught up because obviously it's a super stressful job. You yeah. haven't been home in months. You have to freaking poop in a bus. We get it. Um, <laughs> but it's always important to take some time, like, you know, 10 minutes, dude, to open up your email and say, where am I? What city is this? Oh, shit. Okay, let me go through the email. Let me tell the driver, here's the map, like, or even like learning how to streamline your processes. Like make yourself a checklist of yeah. what you need to do every time you get to a new city. You know, especially if you're dealing with a picky artist that mm -hmm. needs gluten-free pistachios and kombucha <laughs> made out of puppy tears. Like, <laughs> yeah, those writers. Yeah. yeah, another thing about those house writers, I don't know if that was gonna be your next questions, but those house writers are pretty much intense. and. They usually are not updated per city or per venue. So what I get heartbroken is the waste of food that is left behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, do like that is so uncalled for. Like if you know your talent by the third, if you don't know your talent by the third city they've gone, then obviously you're not paying attention to your job. Mm -hmm. But if you know that your talent, you know, take time to your talent to review that writer, make sure that they've either want to change something or just remove something off the list because you've noticed that it has not been used or whatever you just want to make sure that the next city you go to we don't waste food we don't waste money um by going exactly. all out and then having this whole bunch of you know leftovers so exactly. it, it, it's basically just being very attentive and very organized and mm -hmm. and, and again over communicating as as annoying that could be but it's also going to help you at the end of the day yeah and absolutely mm -hmm. no it comes to I'd rather have over communication than under communication because mm -hmm. like not, not every venue is as organized as, as you guys are. Um, it's, it's been no. nice and it's, it's real. It's been nice and easy to work with you guys. There's some venues where I can't even talk to the venue about a show until the day before the show. Um, oh, yes. or, or I send them the information. I, I show up and I pray they got it. Um, ah. <laughs> and I try to show up before the artist. So in case there's something not there that I make sure it's there before they show up. Um, so it's nice to, to work with a venue that no it's definitely it. timing time management like especially if you're the talent you as as a you have to be there at least with enough time before the talent arrives to make sure that you your venue and you got everything in place for this and you have enough room to make any changes so definitely um for those who are planning time management it's gonna either kill you or make you or save you because um, you gotta be there. You always gotta be ahead of the game. Yeah. Always, always Absolutely. like your call time. If your time call time is seven 30, be prepared to be there five o'clock, five 30. Yeah. So Absolutely. you have enough, you not, you have enough time to like put out any fires or, or make any corrections or update or figure or, out where to park. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or figure out what to park and, and make sure you, you already met your whole entire staff at the venue. That's going to help you. Mm -hmm. 
Please know, please yeah. know where to park. Anyone that's doing a show. Yes, please know, know where, to where to park. In fact, please open your email and attachment. Yeah. Yeah, it's my it's my biggest pet peeve. Someone calling me and asking, "Hey, what's the gate code, or how do I get to the parking?" Nah, I'm like, "Serious? Nah. I don't see <laughs> oh, no parking. Where's our parking? Where's yeah. our parking? Where's yeah. your valet?" Really good piece of advice if you're a promoter or a tour manager is check your feelings at the bus before mm. you walk in the door, mm. because. You know, we we know you just got into a fight with the band. You just had a million things. Your boss pitched you out. Of, of, a million things could be going wrong. But you're about to enter a new venue where they've never met you, yep. and you don't know what's happening in the venue either. And at the end of the day, and this goes for this goes for us too as a venue too. Like yeah. we, we remind ourselves of this too. The only person you can control in life is yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. So you decide what kind of day you want to have when you step into the venue. Yep. So decide so what kind of day, what kind of day you want to have. Mm -hmm. One thing I always tell my crew, always use common sense and common courtesy. Yep. Common sense and common courtesy will take you a long way. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's being, being mindful of, of others, right? Knowing they are mm -hmm. probably dealing with something that we have no idea about. And then, um, like, like Gabby said, like you, can't, you can't change other people. All you mm -hmm. can change is your reaction to how they're behaving. And sometimes by changing your own reaction, they might change too. And then sometimes people are just jerks and then what you do with those days is like 12 o'clock we'll be here in four hours and i'll never see this person again right <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly oh yes oh yeah it has happened it has happened <laughs> yeah so miami is one of those places that is like new york la nashville atlanta and those types of cities where cool stuff happens like maybe you have a show happening and then some unannounced celebrity shows up and uh, either becomes part of the show or they're hanging out backstage. So the, the opportunity of dealing with celebrities is more frequent in a city like Miami. Um, what advice would you give to someone in dealing with those last minute uh, occurrences? Like when you all of a sudden find out, hey, in 30 minutes, so-and-so is gonna be here. Um, what advice would you give to someone how to deal with that quickly and, and safely for not just the audience, but also for the celebrities that are showing up? Paul Connie. <laughs> oh wow gabby <laughs> um you gotta, be quick. Is. <laughs> you gotta be quick i mean again getting into this field you're gonna have to think outside the box mm -hmm. you gotta improvise you gotta mm -hmm. improvise you gotta you gotta think uh, uh, logistics logistics is gonna be a tool that you need to know how to master because you gotta think quick could be on your toes like you gotta that's what i'm saying time time management is very important in this because if you have given yourself enough time to deal with the minimum like like the basic stuff that should have already been gotten out of the way prior to the show day it gives you room to handle those last minute 30 minutes of of, of prior to the show so you mm -hmm. just gotta you know use always common sense always common <laughs> sense um even though you feel like it's gonna be impossible just put that Vaseline on your teeth and just keep smiling and just <laughs> nod your head because that's when you're going to depend on your team, on your mm -hmm. venue team and make that happen. So come by checking your attitude at the door and building a nice relationship with the venue staff is going to help you a, a lot because mm -hmm. if you need to run and trust me, that's happened to us. Like we had to pull like, a, not, I'm not sure. Like I sometimes have to run and go get a, a large pizza while yeah. I'm walking and, and I'm still giving orders to the next department that I need to give orders, but they don't know that I'm ordering a pizza for a last minute request from a, from a talent who showed up 15 minutes ago. So you just gotta know, like compose yourself. Think, what would Jesus do? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> I think, I think just very, his fingers. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think a practical advice if you if you if you work in a venue, you should know the ins and the outs of the yeah. venue, yes. regardless because you work there. But as a promoter, when you get to a new venue that you've never been to, especially, don't just get familiar with the stage door. Yes, like, right, take, yeah. a, take <laughs> yes. five minutes and just walk the perimeter, yes. or just ask like, hey, besides the stage, because a lot of times people that go to the same venue often will figure out where the stage door is. Yeah. So if you have mm -hmm. a last minute guest or high profile celebrity you're not going to want to use the stage door because you're going to have yeah. people gathered there. Yeah, you right. got to be realistic. So, the, so mm -hmm. you always have to have plan A, B, C. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes D. Because it, rain, <laughs> it rains in Miami 24-7. Yeah. 
Yep. <laughs> right. So, so definitely your, your job is to scope out the venue to mm -hmm. Go ahead yeah. and and connect. Okay, who's the one who deals have with it here? The have minute a you get into the venue, have a walkthrough with every single department. Exactly. To the lady that cleans the bathrooms, have a freaking walkthrough with everybody. Exactly. And that's when you talk about plan A, B, and C. C, yes. And that's it. Basically, is a production person that is on on hand, the production manager, uh, uh, whoever's doing talent, whoever's receiving talent. Because a lot of people get it confused and get too comfortable becoming shummy with the tech crew, which is great. But mm -hmm. their mind is not to receive the talent. Their mind is just, I mean, their mind is not to think about the logistic, how to get the talent from. They just want to get, receive and get the talent handed off to them so they could go on to what they're actually there for. So make sure that you ask these questions prior to your pre-production, like who does the talent logistic, who's responsible for the drop-offs? How do we do this? What are the entrance points? So that's when pre-production comes mm -hmm. into play, getting mm -hmm. these answers ready and already plan the worst hope you know plan the worst because like you said what happens if but in 30 minutes a very high celebrity um is coming through the doors and we have a sold out full house mm -hmm. yeah common sense is you're obviously not going to get them through the main entrance what yeah. is my option b c whatever d to make sure that the safety of the talent the safety of everybody is into play and then everything else will fall you know everything else will make sense but but yeah it's it's about you know doing your 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 dual your due diligence and yep. and making sure that you know you cross those t's and dot those i's prior so true yeah what is one of your favorite celebrity experiences gabby oh my god i have a few of them <laughs> um my top favorite one at the olympia was meeting the guys from last podcast for sure <laughs> um the, you know what? Another great experience was uh, we were lucky to have the last leg of one of RuPaul's tours. Yeah. One of the times that they came. And that because one. it was the last show, yeah, they left a bunch of stuff in the dress room. I'm talking about wigs, eyelashes, oh, wow. earrings, sewing yeah. machine. So, like, to, the, to, to, to us, it was like Christmas. Everything <laughs> a broke theater company needs. Everything a broke theater company needs, <laughs> yeah. the Queens provided. S sponsored by RuPaul. Yeah, <laughs> I have sponsored to. by RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah, no, I have to agree with, with Gabby. That has been a far most best experiences. I have, have had all the drag queens, including Bianca the Real, in there. I'm such a fan. And, and just, you know, sometimes as... We, we're kind of low-key, you know, also like fans and everything like that. And sometimes I always say, like, I'm kind of afraid to meet my idol, to meet the person I'm a fan with, because mm -hmm. I don't want to get disappointed. They'll, they will let you down like this. Exactly. So I don't want to be disappointed because of their how they really are. But so far, the queens have been amazing. They, they've been so, like, I look forward to those shows. And Gabby could tell you, like, if we have to be there at the venue at 7 a.m., I'll do it. <laughs> I'm there for 12 hours if I yeah. have to, because I Another, enjoy. Go ahead. No, go, no, go, 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 sorry. No, I just enjoy the presence. I enjoy, I enjoy what they do. I, and then not only that, that they're very humble and they're very mm -hmm. grateful. Not one has ever been rude. And, and um, yeah, they're just fun. They're just fun. And, and, and that's it. Like I, those have been one of the, the ones I really liked. I really liked also uh, La Santa Cecilia. La Santa Cecilia was a great, great, uh, yeah. great, talented band. They're, they're a Mexican band from LA and they do like uh, pop rock and mixed with like Mexican influences. It's very modern, very edgy. So that was one of the, uh, one of the things. Actually, they were, they were great because um, they were just like doing their laundry at the theater yeah. and just like chilling. Um, I remember one of my all-time favorite music experiences at the Olympia was with DJ Kid Koala. Mm -hmm. um, and, Penny, were you working there, DJ no. Kid Koala? Oh, man. Mm -hmm. um, so Kid Koala had a show where he he did a puppet show based on one of his, um, what's that called, the cartoon, the Marvel, the comic, comic book, based on a comic book. And he also did the score live on stage. Oh, so wow. he had a full string quartet and he had his DJ equipment there. So, and then he was also filming it and then streaming it on a giant screen. So he was wow. filming the puppet show, live scoring it and transmitting it on a giant, it was it, mind blowing. And then he had a DJ set in the lobby afterwards. And when I met him that day, he was so nice, dude, so down to earth. 
So, I mean, he's Canadian, bro. What do you expect? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I, I told my husband, I was like, dude, this guy's really cool. I think, I think, and he's a huge fan. So he was like, so we had these inflatable costumes. We had a, a, an inflatable T-Rex and an inflatable Godzilla. So we actually surprised Kid Koala while he was doing his DJ set. We came out with our inflatable costumes, but we were in the audience because we didn't want to just like ambush him. And he loved it so much that he called us up there and we climbed up into the DJ booth and then he sees that it's me, like the lady that's been bringing him coffee and like taking care of him all <laughs> afternoon. He's like, what? Dude, it's you. I'm like, yes. So he like moves away from the DJ table and has me pretend DJing with my T-Rex costume ah, on. That's, that's so awesome. cool. <laughs> and like the theater just like exploded and like Godzilla, it, it was like one of the most epic moments. <laughs> and then we, he, and then he said whenever we're in Toronto, we could uh, couch surf. Oh nice. yeah, see so you could koala. Yeah. You said we could couch surf in your house, so. <laughs> I love it. But for for that person that's that's crazy enough that wants to open a venue, um, and I'd say they're still in a design and construction phase. What one or two things would you should they pay extra attention to prior to opening their venue? Look, if you're in Miami, I would say be wary of shady contractors, mm. especially if you're in the in the design part. You know, there's a lot of like people that will not do their work properly and up to code. There's a lot of, you know, I think go with the union, you know, it's to be on the safe side. Um, there's a lot of shady people here, man. And then they'll tell you that yeah, we'll build a stage, we'll build the trusting, we'll build everything. And then it's unsafe and it's a piece of shit. So yeah, no, make sure you have your permits. Make sure that you're getting permits, that you are following the, the city and local and state guides to, to get proper, you know, so you, there's no pushback when it becomes in time for inspection. Like you definitely want to make sure that you don't get cheated and, and you don't get a contractor that's going to do that shady job. And then you don't get approved when it's time for accept, uh, inspections. Um, I feel like, like people just want to get it done so fast that, you know, that they just, Oh, I'll get through it. Don't worry about it. I'll buy myself to the inspector. No, right. make sure you do things legit. It comes, mm -hmm. it's worth it because at the long yeah. run, when you start doing things, do it once and do it right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then make sure you're, you're, you have enough real estate to, to plan or what type of, of events you want to have in your venues. Like mm -hmm. if you, you know, just make sure that you know exactly where, what type of venue you want it to be mm -hmm. like, you know, um, in Miami, we're, we're always in competition. Like, for example, Olympia Theater, we were the first historic theater. So obviously, um, our capacity is minimum compared to other huge theaters that have been built around us. Um, but make your venue be unique. Mm -hmm. Make it Find your unique. niche. Yeah. Yeah. Like, find your niche. Find what makes it stand out from the, from the rest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Olympia has, that the fact that that it hasn't been touched for the 94 years and and it has that beautiful interior and you know just just make sure that you you find that niche that's going to stand out yeah. from the rest one thing about the olympia theater is it was designed in a time where microphones and amplifiers did not exist so the building itself was designed to have maximum acoustics for the was well, for the performances that were there so it started with silent film where you would provide the sound of the film via an organ so so sound needed to travel in the venue and then you get into vaudeville you get into orchestra music so i think if you have the fortune because honestly in in, in the world that we live in if you're building your own venue and you're designing it you're freaking lucky and where can i send my resume um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you are doing that, then, then something to keep in mind, even if you're refurbishing a venue, is what type of music you're going to have there, mm -hmm. especially in the music part of it. Because if you're going to do a, a folksy kind of Nashville type of bar, you don't want really high ceilings because then your sound's going to be terrible. You want something mm -hmm. intimate. Um, if it's a club and you want a DJ thing, then you do want a big open space. You don't want too many walls, too many columns, you know? So, so it's it's important to know before you settle on the venue before you start going there what is your programming what is your audience what mm -hmm. kind of bands are going to play there yeah yeah so good and, and uh, the thing on the contractor things made me think about uh this quote i hear in real estate a lot 
It's like you think you can't afford an expensive contractor. Well, try hiring a cheap one. Mm, it's going to cost you way more down the road. True. True. Yep. 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 So we've gone a little bit over yep. an hour. Um, no, go ahead, Gabby. Ooh. <laughs> I was, was going to say, there's an expression in Spanish that says, el flojo trabaja doble, the lazy man works twice. Yeah, so true, man. Um, so now we've gone a little bit over an hour. Um, do you guys have time for some quick, uh, fun, getting to know Gabby and Connie questions? Okay. Quick ones, yes. <laughs> so first one, what's your greatest fear? Gabby. Connie. Oh, oh. So I thought that was your answer. <laughs> no, you go first, Gabby. <laughs> that was good. Um, <laughs> my greatest fear uh, of being alone. Like alone, like alone. Yeah. My biggest fear. Like, uh, uh, go ahead, finish, finish, finish. No, 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 go, go. Mine's is silly. Uh, my fear is lizards. I have a phobia of lizards. <laughs> That's, That's it. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are some of your past and current mentors? Uh, current, my, my boss has been a huge mentor for me for many years, Robert. He's, he's been one of my current mentors for sure. He's taught me a lot. Uh, basically, everything I know about the Olympia Theater and my experience there has been thanks to him. Uh, mentor, I guess more than a mentor, people that inspire me a lot. Um, Connie, for sure, she's, oh she's inspired me in so many, many ways. Um, my husband is a huge mentor for me, too, because he's always, um, you know, kind of helping me navigate all my issues. And when I'm down, he reminds me of, you know, why I'm great. He makes Gabby great again. Yay, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Aww. Uh, for me, it's been a lot of many people. I, I feel like mentors and, and a lot of people that come, you just learn from a lot of people. I think um, I had a, a few mentors that, that, you know, believed in me and took me under their wings and it taught me for who I am today or oh, what I've learned. So that I will never, you know, forget and, and always be grateful, forever grateful for that. Um, I want to say people that inspire me. I mean, people like Gabby who are so creative and so I think out of the box. I love people that do that. Like they, they, they're just, you know, just creativity is amazing. Creativity and, and, and the way that they just pursue it and the way they just go after it. Cause I'm sometimes an introvert when it comes to that. And Gabby could tell you, like, I could be this, this production person, like blah, blah, blah. But then when it comes to be on stage, I'm like, ah, biting my, I'm like stage freak. So, so I, I get that inspiration of like, kind of to finally get out of my shells by people like Gabby with that type of, of ability of just, you know, getting out there and speaking and, and doing all of that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm up there in age. So, so I, want, I can't, I, I have, I've had a lot, uh, one that I will never forget. And I'm forever grateful who retired this year is, um, Dr. Underwood my TV production teacher. He believed in me when nobody did. So that's that. I, I love you guys. I love you guys. Love Fest. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I miss working with y'all. <laughs> yeah. Aww, we miss you, Chris. I know. It's, it's emotional. It's a very, been an emotional time for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, tell me about yeah. your, t yeah. tell me about your first concert uh, that you've been to, or your first memorable concert. Gabby? Oh, yes. <laughs> I went to go see Shakira. Oh. When I was like, I want to say 11, 11 or 12. It was the first time that I went to a concert without my parents or like a legit concert concert, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, like I had seen live music before, but it was never like something that I wanted to go see. Like that was my first artist, you know, and it was amazing. And we had really good tickets. I don't know why we had like almost front row. Like it was insane. Oh, wow. And it was back when Shakira was like protest and feminist and cool. <laughs> so she was like the Alanis Morissette of yeah. Latin yeah. America. The, the brunette Shakira. The brunette <laughs> Shakira. Yes. With her long hair. And then, and then she, she, that was one of the first times that she belly danced and I started doing it live. And I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I had so much fun that I left my jean jacket, that my 90s jean jacket <gasps> with my giant Mickey Mouse in the back. On. I know. <laughs> and I got in so much trouble for losing that jacket because before I left the house, my mom said, it's hot. Why are you going to wear a jacket? I was like, because it's the 90s and I'm 11. I want to look good. <laughs> and she told me not to lose it. And she jinxed me. Mm. Oh, no. 
uh, my first concert. I am a '90s person. I went to NSYNC, and oh, nice. we had gotten front row tickets to a point that it was at the West Palm Beach Amphitheater. So yes. we, um, we, we, I'm telling you, I was an NSYNC fanatic, a stan, as they say. Um, I, I got in trouble weeks before because um, they, they filmed uh, Music of My Heart with Gloria Stefan in my high school in the gym. Oh, wow. And because I was such a Justin Timberlake fan, I decided to break all the rules and sleep over that night <laughs> at the gym so I could wake up the next morning and be like, Oh, what happened? Oh my God, it's you guys. Well, that all failed. I got detention. <laughs> Don't do it, guys. Um, but I did took a picture with them. But then um, I already had tickets for them for their concert, and I had told them, and they got uh, I got upgraded, and I was literally oh, nice. sitting next to Justin Timberlake's mom, Joey oh, wow. Tone's parents. Uh, it was it was uh, it was an amazing amazing concert. I will never forget that. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Man, you guys had such good tickets on your uh, first show. I, I sat in nosebleeds when I saw Guns N' Roses in 1992. All the way up there. Oh, man. <laughs> I, saw, I saw Guns N' Roses uh, the last time they were here in Miami with Axl Rose, but without Slash. Mm -hmm. Oh, but they it's were the same. amazing, bro. It, it's I not, know. It's not I the know, same as Slash. I know. I, I just saw them again in, in November. It was in November, October of last year, 2019. And... Um, back with a full lineup. I mean, not, not the full lineup, you know, at least they're like the main three, the yeah. um, Slash and Axel, and they still wow. got it. And it's, yeah. it's some, something magical when the three of them are together versus when, when it's not the three of them. Yeah. yeah. That reminded me, quick story, about this um, Vice video of, of um, the Guns N' Roses concert in the 90s in Bogota, oh. in Colombia, oh. remember? <laughs> um, dude, if you guys are listening, Google Vice, Guns N' Roses Colombia and watch that video. It's the promoter okay. from Colombia that brought the Guns N' Roses band to Colombia for the first time. I think the only time that they were ever there. And everything went wrong. So like oh, if yeah. you want oh, a masterclass wow. on promoting, watch it. Okay. Oh wow. That I'm definitely gonna look at it. Yeah, yeah. check that yeah. out as well. So we'll okay. throw it in the show notes. I have show notes for every episode. So whatever we talk about, I'll have that. I'll add that to the notes. Um now, what is an app? What is something you're currently really interested in? So it could be a TV show, it could be an app, it could be exercise, food, whatever. What's something you're really currently into? I'm gonna tell you now, really quick, and you know that, Chris. I've been off the on and off with uh, with keto. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> so I've now had time to do my own keto food, follow keto recipes. Nice. So I'm obsessed with almond flour and everything that could happen with almond flour. So yes, I've been taking upon a lot of like cooking and baking for this keto supposedly diet that I have. But, <laughs> What's yeah. your favorite thing to make with almond flour? Um, this uh, one minute mug cake minute where mug cake. you just, yeah, a mug cake. It's a keto mug cake out of almond flour. It's just super easy. Uh, it's baking powder, um, almond flour, uh, butter what else with a sweetener you mix it up you could put some vanilla or cinnamon on it mix it mix it mix it put it in the microwave for a minute it becomes this like nice sponge cake mm -hmm. and you could just put whatever topping you want and it's fabulous it's delicious <laughs> guilt-free pleasure <laughs> yes <laughs> what about you gabby um well i think uh I mean, I already said this, but one of the things that I discovered is editing, editing video. Um, I love it, man. I hadn't done it in many, many years. And now I started to uh, trying to find free programs to edit with because, you know, times are hard. And mm. since the last time I edited, which was about 10 years ago till now, um, the technology has advanced so much hmm. and there's a few uh, uh, quirky little programs out there that uh, that you can download well, one's called shortcut um one's called hd movie maker pro i paid nine bucks for each one of those and they are legit a ripoff of premiere hmm. um super super but they work for, for you know for for your own personal stuff like if you're gonna like a legit big project get premiere or get vegas or whatever it is get one of the big ones um but for, for what I've been doing, they've been great, man. And I feel like I want to maybe take an editing class and maybe like oh, start cool. exploring like more of an audiovisual career. That's awesome. Yeah. Might, uh, may, I, may I find my uh, next video editor? <laughs> oh, man. Hey. Holly, let's do it, man. Let's do it. 
And hey. watch out, I'll learn, I'll learn Audacity too and we'll, we'll produce the songs. See why she's an inspiration? See yep. why she's an inspiration? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the patience for that. I'll be like, ah, throw them. Ed editing <laughs> takes so much patience. <laughs> yeah, I was telling her, I started editing back when it was like by frame. So t trust me, you have to have the patience. Yeah, for, that. for sure. So one more before I ask the, the last question. Um, what is something you like to see change in our industry? Diversity. Hmm. Yeah. Diversity. Yeah. We need more, more, more minorities mm -hmm. in everything and every, and every across the board. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. And then uh, before I ask you the last question, I just want to thank you both for, for being on the, the show and for sharing and all your good tips and good advice. And uh, thanks for also being a good example um, of our industry of, of how yeah. we should conduct business and just been, you know, thanks for all the fun times working with you guys as well. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, it was a pleasure as well, Chris. You're one of the few that made our job way easier yeah. and so much fun. Thanks. I'm glad to hear that. New then, plan. Uh, Let's start our own production company. Let's do it. I'm in. <laughs> awesome. I'm in. <laughs> awesome. New, new venture. And then yeah. the question I ask at the end is, what's your definition of making it? It's open to driving. <laughs> making it, making it. It's so weird, man. I thought in my early 20s, I thought making it was going to be seeing my name on a billboard, you know, and, and being on Ellen, which is, it's still there in the, in the back of my head one day or on Oprah. But now, man, making it to me now just means that you pay your rent doing what you love. Love it. Yeah. It's loving what you do, making it is finally loving what you do and being at peace with it. Like, you know, like loving mm -hmm. it and learning. It's never, never stop learning because making always something new. And yeah. and yeah, making it is when you know you love doing it and you don't care about having to wake up early in the morning or going late to sleep at night, as long as you love what you're doing and you're producing and you're providing. Mm hmm I'll tell you one thing, you, you have a dream, but fine tune it mm -hmm. and, and, and narrow it down and focus, you know, because being famous, being a star, winning an Oscar, like that only happens to a percentage of the population. Um, whereas there's so many ways that you could be in the music industry and still make it and still be happy about it. So just fine tune that dream. Ah!